you talk a little bit about uh, the debate between degrowth and green green growth um, and whether there's a course of action that both sides in this debate might be able to sign up to. So I'm going to start off by just briefly outlining the two positions. So next slide shows um, on the one side of the debate, there are those who are kind of deeply skeptical about the idea of infinite growth on a finite planet. So if you go to the next slide, Emily, um, there's a whole bunch of uh, uh, book titles there. So we're talking about the green growth skeptics, including those who are advocating for degrowth, for prosperity without growth, for steady state economics, for donut economics, for well-being economics. I don't know if anyone else is. Uh... Yes, great. It has moved on. Um, <laughs> um, uh, well-being economics, the recent work by Catherine Trebek. Um, and then in the opposite corner, um, next slide, Emily. Um, we've got uh, green growth advocates who believe that the historical relationship between GDP and environmental impact um, can't just be weakened, but can be effectively severed, as I show here. So this is the emissions pathway consistent with 1.5 degrees going down and uh, business as usual going up. Um, and what's key for green growthers is the idea of decoupling, so that's like reducing the environmental impact associated with each pound of GDP. Um, now, the degrowth um, activists, um, we were, I'm not going to talk about this slide for a second, um, the degrowth and post-growth economists, they don't dispute the need for decoupling, but what they argue is that it's really irresponsible to put all of our eggs in that basket of decoupling, if you like. And so to illustrate why, from a climate perspective, um, they argue that it is that irresponsible. I'm going to, in a moment, show you a graph from a recent study uh, published in Nature by Lorenz Kayser and Manfred Lenz, and I hope I've pronounced those names right. It's a pretty dorky graph, okay? So, but because this is uh, the responsible scientists uh, get together, I thought I'd uh, risk it, um, but I'll give you a little bit of background before I show you the graphic. So five years after Paris, the IPCC um, published this special report on, on, on pathways to 1.5 degrees, emissions mitigation pathways, that is. And they all assumed, pretty much, um, continued growth in gross domestic product. In order, and, and in order to achieve the emissions reductions whilst maintaining growth, they had to rely on really unprecedented changes in our economy and in technology. And the ambition of those changes can be thought of as occurring on three dimensions, okay? So on the one hand, you've got decoupling of energy use from GDP. So that's reducing the amount of energy that's required for every pound's worth of GDP. If you skip forward a, fly, uh, a slide now, um, Emily, this is just going to show you the historical, historically very close relationship between um, energy use and GDP. Um, the second dimension of change is the pace of renewable rollout, okay? And the third dimension of change is the um, scale of uh, carbon dioxide that we can um, suck out of the atmosphere using the technologies that Lorraine was talking about. Okay, so in the next graph, um, what you can see is our achievements to date in terms of those first two dimensions. So if you move to the right on that slide, um, you're getting a higher level of decoupling of energy and GDP. Um, and if you move up on that slide on the, on the vertical axis, the further towards the top, the faster the pace of renewables development. Okay, so you can see those little black dots representing progress um, to date. Um, and obviously the red line, it, it shows the direction that we wanna be going in. Now, if we go to the next slide, we'll see what this, um, and the next one again, we'll see what this study in Nature did was compare that progress to date with the pace of change required in all these different mitigation scenarios. So all these dots represent different scenarios, some of them from the IPCC, some of them from elsewhere. Um, and the size of the dot there represents that third dimension of change that I mentioned, which is the volume of carbon dioxide that's assumed to be possible to be removed from the atmosphere. And so the important thing to note here, because there's lots of different colors there, it's only the really dark green dots on the left-hand side, those are the only scenarios that relax 
the assumption about growth. Yeah, the rest of them all assume business as usual growth between two and a half and three and a half percent. Now, <laughs> you don't have to be a degrowth advocate to uh, to be a fully sort of paid up degrowth member. I think to look at that graph and say, yikes, you know, if we if we're going to. Um, well, to at least look at that graph and say, OK, if we can reduce the pace of growth, that is going to substantially reduce the risk of relying on these huge technological leaps that in every other scenario we have to rely on. OK, so obviously the green growth advocates would respond and say, oh, well, you know, the historical record shouldn't be taken as a guide to what we can do in the future. And if we're pessimistic about technological breakthroughs and that that will be self-fulfilling. OK. Now, this is, you know, a, a compelling and entertaining debate for some people, um, but it's not going to be, let's be frank, it's not a debate that's going to be settled in a time frame that's useful uh, for maintaining a habitable planet. And my concern is that the more time we spend in this nerdy debate about decoupling, the less time we've actually got to, we will have to build a broad based movement that we need to tackle the vested interests who are, are benefiting from the status quo. So in the next slide, um, I've just kind of tried, and the next one, is tried to outline um, a, a strategy consisting of three planks that I really hope will keep people on both sides of this debate happy, at least those who are serious about environmental and social justice. So on the first, uh, the first um, plank in the strategy is the Green New Deal. I'm not going to say a lot about that because it's such a no brainer. Everyone can see we need massive investment in, uh, you know, public transport insulation and all the um, behavior changes that Lorraine was talking about. It's going to be good for jobs, uh, good for people in fuel poverty, clean up the air, win, win, win. Fantastic. Second plank is limits on resource use, habitat destruction, pollution. And notice that I'm not talking about limits to GDP. I'm talking about limits to the things that we care about, yeah? Environmental destruction. And I think one of the reasons that people get really upset about the idea of degrowth is that they imagine it involving some kind of descending cap on national income. Um, now, as far as I know, there are no serious thinkers in the post-growth movement uh, or degrowth movement who are advocating for that, for sort of trying to somehow control the market value of production and consumption at an ag aggregate level. So even for the degrowthers, GDP reduction is not an end in itself, okay? It's considered a likely outcome of putting in place those uh, uh, limits on resource use and habitat destruction and pollution. So that brings me to the third plank in this strategy, which is about, um, back one, which is about preparing our economy for the possibility that those resource limits will constrain growth. OK, um, and that's about addressing the fact that we are currently dependent upon growth to maintain economic and political stability. Um, if GDP uh, flatlines or contracts, our economy currently will tend to topple into crises of unemployment and debt and inequality and hardship. So it's really no wonder that policymakers remain totally preoccupied with this economic metric, despite the very widespread consensus now that GDP is not a very good measure of progress. So I would argue that this preoccupation with GDP is not actually only a, a problem from the point of view of uh, um, environmental policies, because yes, the specter of, of, of shrinking GDP, as we know, is, is invoked regularly to try and block environmental policies, but it's also used to water down food standards and labor rights and so on. And very recently we saw a, the sort of visceral fear of economic contraction, um, becoming an impediment to containing a pandemic. Remember Rishi Sunak's eat out to help out. Um, so our dependence on growth puts policymakers in a really dangerous straitjacket, right? Because when there are certain forms of economic activity that imperil our health or imperil our well-being, we need the gov government to have the confidence to scale back those activities without the fear of triggering e an economic crisis. And we can only do that, we can only have that confidence, rather, if we end our, our dependence on growth. But again, crucially, ending our dependence on growth does not foreclose the possibility of growth. Okay, It just makes our society resilient in the face of economic contraction and economic shock. So there shouldn't be anything inherently objectionable about that for green growth optimists. 
And in a moment, I'm going to argue that the economic changes that we need to make our economy resilient in the face of economic contraction would actually be emancipatory for the majority of people anyway, who are, who are suffering from precarity and exploitation under the current system. But before I get into all that, I, I'm, I'm a bit lost about how much time I've got um, left. Um, uh, you can have two minutes, Beth, two minutes. Right. OK. I wanted to say a little bit um, about um, why limits are so essential. So if you could just go to the next slide, um, uh, Emily. Um, you don't have to be, again, I don't think you have to be a degrowth advocate to recognize that efficiency gains on their own are not going to guarantee the uh, environmental um, change that we need to see at an aggregate level. Um, if you go to the next slide, what we actually know from the history of capitalism is that efficiency gains on their own will tend to stimulate consumption rather than lead to re resource use. So this illustrates the development of computer technology. Clearly, computers in 1946 required more resources and materials than they do in 2010. But the computer industry as a whole has a much higher material footprint now. Why? Because the efficiency gains that were made made computers more affordable for many more people, so consumption grew. But this is, so this is an example of a very direct rebound effect, but in fact, most rebounds effects happen um, more indirectly. Next slide. Um, so just to give one example, if we were to build out um, green transport, affordable transport, or you know, insulate all our homes, people would be saving money on their bills, on their energy bills, on their transport costs. What do they do with that money? they're going to spend it on some form of consumption. Now, hopefully they'd spend it on something low carbon, like a haircut, but they might, next slide, spend it on a foreign holiday and um, that they wouldn't have uh, previously um, uh, been able to afford. So unless you have those limits at the aggregate level, there will be some form of rebound, okay? Um, so let's get back then. I'll just skip, skip over what I was going to say there um, to try and be able to cover what is required to reduce our growth dependency. Um, what, what do we need to change about the economy so that everyone's needs can be met um, without relying on continu continued consumption growth? If you go to the next slide, this is a diagram from, um, and the next one, um, from a report that I published um, uh, during lockdown outlining some of the things we could change about our economy coming out of the, the pandemic in order to reduce our growth dependency. And I, I covered four main strategies here relating to jobs, rents, basic needs and debt. OK, so first one, why is it, uh, if we go forward a slide, Emily, why is it that we um, associate low levels of growth with rising unemployment? Well, it's because automation and mechanization over time allow us to produce the same amount of stuff with less people and time, which creates the specter of robots stealing our jobs. Um, and historically, we've relied on consumption growth in order to generate more work and avoid rising unemployment. But there's obviously a more environmentally friendly and sustainable way to maintain employment, and that's to share out the remaining work, um, uh, you know, to basically take the benefits of productivity improvements in leisure time, in a shorter working week, rather than more consumption. But that is not a solution that private or, uh, you know, profit oriented companies are going to deliver of their own accord. It's going to require a massive shift in the balance of power in workplaces so that people who invest their labor are no longer systematically uh, excluded from decision making. Historically, working time reduction has only happened through worker bargaining and legislation and is stalled when, uh, in recent years as the balance of power shifted away from workers. Next slide. Um, Will, brings me to the second strategy. Okay, those are just a couple of reports you could read on uh, uh, on that subject. Next slide. Um, and again, <laughs> um, is on the, on the on the subject of and again uh, tackling rent extraction. Um, rents. When political economists talk about rents, they're not just talking about incomes extracted by landlords. They're talking about um, incomes that are extracted by anybody with control over scarce or monopolized assets. So most of us have to work to earn a living. People who control things like land and housing, energy infrastructure, utilities, finance, intellectual property, they've got the power to extract um, unearned rents at everybody else's expense. But you cannot have that accumulating power and wealth 
people taking a bigger and bigger slice of the pie when the pie is not growing itself anymore. So diffusing that power to extract rents and socializing the unearned, unavoidable rents is, is, is an absolutely essential part of escaping the growth dependency. Okay, next slide. Um, and again, um, this is this, the third um, part is about reducing the threat of debt crisis. It's very hard to pay down debt without growth. So we need a strategy for reducing the burden of debt in the economy. Lots of different um, uh, things that I could talk about here, but I'm conscious of not wanting to take up more than my fair share. So let's skip to the last one, which is about safeguarding basic needs. In the UK, Many of our essential goods and services, social care, energy, water, transport have been privatized and are now controlled by uh, private companies and our ability to access them depends on you know, our economic fortune. That makes us very, very vulnerable if, if we fall on hard times. It also makes it almost impossible to introduce carbon taxes, by the way, because it's the poorest in society who are already struggling to cover the cost of energy and fuel who will who'll do worse. Um, if we see the price of um, carbon shift right across the economy. But what can you do about that? Well, you extend this principle of free public services that we've already accepted in the, in the realm of healthcare and education to all the other realms, childcare, social care, transport, energy, water, access to the internet. So everyone can access life's essentials. How do we pay for it? Well, taxing rents is a really, really big part of the answer, um, and I'll leave it there. Um, but basically, just so you can go to, to the end uh, uh, now, Emily, but those four changes together basically improve, improve the resilience of the economy in the face of shocks. They substantially reduce precarity and exploitation that's currently experienced by millions of people under the current system, and they make it more feasible to keep fossil fuels in the ground and halt the destruction of, of, of the living planet. So... Again, I think it's a win-win-win, uh, and that's um, that's where I'll leave it. Thank you very much. Beth, that's an extraordinary compression of a huge landscape of issues and analysis into a very small space. Thank you so much. And I will apply the principle of equity in terms of uh, answering questions and hold those two 